by having you drop them in uh, drop them in the chat. About halfway through the program, we're gonna you know we're gonna be skimming those and looking for um, some common questions. So we'll we'll stop Anna for a short time, maybe ask a couple of questions. But most of the questions we're gonna ask you guys to hold them to the end, and then we'll have you know 15 or 20 minutes to go ahead and and get some questions directly pointed at Anna for those. Um, so at this time, we'd like to just remind everybody who has joined us that um, to mute themselves during the program and um, to just stay muted. So it's a little bit kinder for everyone trying to listen through. Um, we will be dropping a link to the evaluation of this program in the chat several times, but we will follow up with an email at the end of, or tomorrow in case you didn't get the um, evaluation done. We do find that the surveys are very simple and straightforward, but they're very valuable to us. So if you could take a couple of minutes to do the evaluation afterwards, that will be very helpful. We really do take into consideration what you guys are suggesting, what you guys need for information and programming, and we want to do content that's valuable. So as incentive for doing those, we do have a little we're going to do two little um, prize packs for just a random name of an evaluation that's done. So we have these awesome loops that you can do IPM in your high tunnel with. And we also have a little bit of solid ground swag that we will put and those will be mailed to you. Um, we are going to be recording the program today. So if you know anyone who um, isn't able to join during this program, it will be available on our website, um, you know, and be posted maybe by the end of the week or something. Um, at this time, we're going to start our program with our land acknowledgement statement. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Mohican the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, the Scaticoke, the Golden Hill Pagusset, the Nipmunk and the Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And we thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and inspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. So we're really excited about the program today. And our solid ground program, just so you know, is made possible by a BFRDP grant, which is the beginning farmer and rancher development program. So thanks to USDA, we get to keep on doing these awesome programs. So at this time, without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce our presenter. She's got a great presentation for us. And because high tunnels and season extension, especially with all the climate change that's happening, are becoming more and more popular and just a, a great way for us to have crops that are, you know, able to have, you know, moisture levels and wind protection and all the other things that are advantageous to us growing food and flowers. So at this time, Dr. Anna Legrand is an entomologist in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture at the University of Connecticut. Her research and extension interests include biological control and plant insect interactions. She's currently working on trap crops for brassicas, brassica insect pests, and the use of in insectary plants and potato leaf hopper monitoring tools. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Anna. And uh, like I said, we'll kind of take a short break in the middle of the presentation to ask a few questions and then at the end as well. So there you go, Anna. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy and Brittany. And uh, I'm happy to be here. And I hope that uh, today we have a nice session talking about biocontrol options in high tunnels. Thank you for the invitation for this program. Um, let me proceed just to start with the definition so we're all clear about the topic for today. Um, biocontrol is a very important IPM tactic and it is a tactic designed to suppress the population of a specific pest organism, making sure it's less abundant and less damaging than what it would otherwise be. 
And for biocontrol, uh, we have uh, locally a number of organisms that we can employ. Uh, here you have a listing of some groups, including parasitoids, predators, beneficial nematodes, and pathogens. Today, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on uh, some predatory examples, parasitoids, and, and some pathogens. But all of the ones that you see here are very important agents um, in biocontrol efforts. Oftentimes, we refer to them as biocontrol agents or BCAs. So you may hear me uh, say that quite a bit uh, throughout today's presentation. And uh, just by example here, you can your screen, you're seeing one of the ones that we're going to dedicate some time today, the Oreos, um, the minute pirate bug, and it's happily there feeding on some white flies. So examples of these organisms are many and really important for us in terms of biocontrol. Biocontrol is really an important IPN tactic, but it's just one piece of the puzzle, really. Um, one thing that I want to encourage you to keep in mind for today is that as we discuss biocontrol, it is just one main effort, but we have to be doing a lot of other things in terms of uh, pest management, in terms of IPM. And really to be successful in our efforts, we gotta keep that IPM toolbox very active, uh, very diverse in terms of the approaches that we employ. And primarily for IPM in general, one of the key aspects is to have proper pest identification. So you will hear me emphasize that today. Um, also, let's not forget, um, it's good to recognize your beneficial insects, those natural enemies that can help us with pest control. Monitoring or scouting are critical in IPM efforts. So as much as we want to do biocontrol, if we don't do monitoring efforts, we're really not um, doing the best that we can. So monitoring is very important to alert us to the presence of a pest to give, give us those early warnings so that we can take action as soon as we can. So monitoring proper pest identification are, are key activities. Also having diversity of pest management tactics is uh, important. Biocontrol is the foundation of many of our efforts, but we also want to include other things as much as we can, especially in the area of preventive approaches. Anything that you can do to help you prevent the pest problem to begin with, it uh, goes a long way. And um, uh, we have a lot of information about those approaches in many of our IPM um, information pieces uh, in the Yukon IPM website and many other uh, outlets where IPM information is available. Lastly, um, evaluation and record keeping are very important. Um, just keeping track of what worked for you in a season, what you did, uh, what tools you employed. Those records are critical in terms of a long-term um, approach to evaluate uh, what is working in your system. So with that in mind, um, let us talk a little bit more specifically about high tunnels. And high tunnels are, an interesting situation. Um, we, as Nancy mentioned, we get many benefits from their use. Um, a lot of help with disease management, with really uh, favorable conditions for plant growth. And on the other hand, we have to keep in mind that some of these uh, situations with high tunnels uh, give us kind of a hybrid thing in terms of uh, having uh, sometimes the um, presence of pest problems that were unexpected. Um, hybrid uh, situations created by the high tunnel really are led by the fact that in these conditions, while we're protecting our plants from, for example, rain event or high moisture, that same rainfall could be a very important mortality factor for many pest problems. So that could be an issue that we have to keep in mind. Those physical factors that may be missing that can kind of help us reduce uh, pest populations. Um, there are other situations too, where um, oftentimes high tunnels are thought like a greenhouse, but it's not quite like that. Because as you can see from these photographs, it's been an open system where a lot of um, insects or arthropods can come in, uh, both the good ones and the bad ones. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So today we're gonna highlight some approaches of biocontrol for common pests that are, are found in high tunnels. I'll be addressing some issues regarding the um, encouragement that we can do to increase our beneficial insects, because just as pests can come in, we hope that we can also encourage um, the arrivals of beneficial insects into these high tunnel systems. So I will be addressing that towards the end. For today, I'm gonna review some key pests that are commonly found in high tunnels. I'll be looking at also some options for biocontrol, 
um, natural enemies that are available for, for release. And also important, uh, that's something that's key, the options to attract and conserve natural enemies that are in the surrounding habitat. One of the aspects with high tunnels is that a lot of our knowledge in terms of biocontrol use really derives from our experience in greenhouses uh, where biocontrol has been extremely successful. So keep in mind greenhouses are a closed system and high tunnels um, in, for most of the time can be an open system. So under those conditions, we could try to encourage uh, many of the beneficial insects that are around. And again, for today, I'll be addressing that part. Lastly, um, I'll be addressing some biopesticide options and um, we'll be, be taking questions as well. So let us um, start with a review of some keepers problems that are often uh, included in most of the concerns that growers have in high tunnels. And one of the ones that uh, always stops the list are aphids. And these are um, very persistent, insidious little insects. Um, aphids are, uh, can be quite damaging. If you don't manage them in time, they could take out your plants. And we want to really catch them as early as possible. So we look for um, signs of the presence, um, early damage, and really we want to avoid the situation that you see in that picture. We don't want to get them to be that numerous. So looking for discoloration, distortion of tissues, um, mold skins of the aphids, and also honeydew, which is an excrement that they produce. Uh, those are sort of signs of the presence that are good to keep in mind. Additionally, obviously, we want to be inspecting our plants, making sure that we don't see um, the beginnings of colonies of aphids, which um, we know in no time they can grow quite rapidly. They are um, able to do this because um, in their biology, um, they're really like a little aphid pump, as you can see here. Um, this is the green peach aphid. This is an adult female. And aphids have the ability to reproduce just by making clones of themselves. And here the female is giving birth uh, to a live aphid that is as soon as it comes out of the female, it's ready to go to start feeding. And she has inside her little body already a bunch of what we call nymphs already ready to come out. Um, one time I was doing a study and I was sitting there looking at aphids and um, I kind of counted that a one P aphid female was putting out like about seven to eight little aphids in uh, one hour. So the reproduction potential is quite impressive. So keep in mind that we're gonna wanna catch them as early as we can. What One other aspect with aphids in terms of um, important information for the recognition is that uh, aphids can come in two forms. Uh, you see here the female aphid without wings, and this is a very common form that we find. We also will see what we call alates or um, winged forms. Aphids produce wings when they're at a point where they need to colonize new plants and they will be producing these forms that can fly out and be moving to better plants where they're not so crowded. So this is again the green peach aphid in its alate form. Now, um, there are many types of aphids out there. Here are some of the common ones that we might encounter um, in greenhouses or in high tunnels. Um, you can see that there is quite a variety. You have the foxglow, foxglow aphid, the green peach aphid, the melon or cotton aphid. And aphids are interesting in that um, they make it a little challenging in terms of their identification because as you can see, for example, in the melon or cotton aphid, that particular species has really a variety of color forms. And I'm just gonna give you some um, guidelines in terms of what we can do to help us with the identification of these aphids. Now here's a potato aphid. That's another one that's uh, very important, especially for tomatoes. This one can be quite a severe pest. So this is an important um, aphid also that we wanna keep our, our eyes out for. And as I was telling you, it comes in different forms. You saw the green one, and here it's a more pinkish reddish form of the same species. All right, before we get into a little bit of tips about identification, I'm gonna give you a little orientation about aphid morphology. And don't be um, you know, surprised by all these terms, but they're very easy to keep track of. Um, one couple pieces of uh, or areas in the aphid body that are, are important for us to keep in mind is the head. And let us look at the head. You have a area here near the base of the antennae. 
These are um, where I'm having my cursor referred to as the antennal tubercle. That really just means it's um, kind of an extension of the head and outgrowth of the head. And it looks quite small, but it's very significant, very helpful in terms of aphid identification. Other areas to look for are the cornicles, which are their opposite uh, on the body at the tip here. These little uh, tailpipes that you see, uh, these little cornicles are also useful in terms of trying to make um, distinguish to distinguish different um, types of aphids. In this uh, diagram, you see in an, uh, the form that has wings. And the next uh, slide is going to show you a little bit about their um, uh, morphology, but this is specifically for the wingless forms. Those aphids that um, are very common, uh, we likely to encounter. And if anybody wants more information about identification for wing forms, it follows a similar pattern and I'll be happy to send you in the right direction for that. So let us look at um, some guidelines in terms of aphid recognition. Again, this is important and it ties um, with biocontrol because many of our biocontrol efforts makes us uh, make decisions about a specific agent that we need to select. And to really go in the right path, we have to have the right test ID. So for the aphids, uh, I mentioned we have four species. Here you have the um, just the heads, actually. Um, this is a nice uh, photo, set of photographs uh, showing you just the head area. And let us begin what, but one very important area that I just mentioned, the area near the base of the antennae, where we have this outgrowth of the head that we refer to, to them as the tubercles. And I have to uh, mention, typically, you need high magnification to really see this very well. But nowadays, uh, many persons have access to really good magnifying lenses or even some digital microscopes that are not expensive at all uh, that you can plug to your computer. Or um, even more easy, sometimes uh, you could buy an adapter to your cell phone, which you could convert your cell phone camera into a little microscope. Um, I have some students that do that often. So it's, it's really, uh, nowadays we have technology that makes it, makes it a little easier to see some details that were more challenging before. But going back to these um, uh, tips for identification, if we look at these uh, areas for the green peach aphid, we have the um, area of the antennal tubercles is what we call convergent, kind of trying to make a little triangle, if you will. So you can see that where my uh, arrow is circling. Uh, for the potato aphid, these areas are more what we call divergent. So it's more like a little open U uh, kind of situation. Melon cotton aphid, these guys didn't get to do much in terms of uh, tubercles. So they have underdeveloped tubercles. And um, you can see that in this picture, really more, more flat with a little bump. And the foxglove aphid uh, has more of what we call a parallel divergent uh, tubercle, where it's more of a kind of a, a little square almost, uh, kind of open uh, to the sides. So those, if you can see that, well, this it's a good way of uh, distinguishing these aphids. Other features um, along with that, uh, as I mentioned, we look at the cornicles for the green peach aphid. Uh, here you have some descriptions where we have um, more of a long uh, cornicles and with good magnification, you may see that they tend to kind of be more swollen towards the tip and they have darker tips as well. For the potato aphid, they have very long slender cornicles, and you can see the pictures later too. Um, these are um, kind of easy to see. Cotton or melon aphid, um, those are easy to spot with short dark cornicles. And lastly, the foxglove aphid is probably one easy one because it has these dark areas around the, the cornicle base. Uh, color, I give you some description there in, in terms of colors, and these are important, but as you have seen from previous images, let me just go back, um, you can see that the color can be quite variable. So some of the more physical aspects in terms of the antennal tubercles, the cornicles can be quite handy. And here we see what I described to you for the foxglove aphid. You can see the darker areas in, at the base of the cornicles. This uh, just done nicely. And the aphid tends to be a bit shiny as well, as you can see. 
For the melon or cotton aphid, the tubercles are kind of shorter and darker in color. And again, with the green peach aphid, um, it's a bit probably challenging to see, but the cornicle tends to be a bit more swollen towards the tip. And keep in mind, look at this little gap um, between the antennae. This is what I was mentioning to you that um, it's a very important area to look in terms of uh, the shape. So, by the way, this presentation, uh, we will make a PDF available in the Yukon IPM website. So if you need to refer to these diagrams and information, it will be available there uh, as well. Let me move on from this to talk about um, other aspects really more tied to what we're doing today in terms of biocontrol. I give you some hints in terms of identification. Let us talk about um, what agents are out there available for uh, aphid management. And luckily for aphids in nature, out, out naturally occurring, we have lots of predators and parasitoids that are very helpful to keep aphids under some degree of control. We also have um, many natural enemies that are commercially available that are mass reared and mass produced so that we can release them um, for uh, aphid management. And in this list, we have uh, groups of predators that include um, Assassidomide midge, aphidolitis, which is a well-known uh, aphid predator, uh, lace wings are also very important, and also a number of lady bear beetles, Adalia and Hippodamia. Parasitoids are also a very important group of natural enemies of aphids and of many other insects. And I will be giving you a bit brief description of how they operate. But for aphids, we have here a number of them, including a couple of aphidius species that are very important, aphidius colemani and aphidius herbi. And Parasitoids are really one of my favorite groups. They're really impressive in what they can do, uh, finding the host and really helping us with uh, pest management. Now, before I talk a bit uh, more with more specificity in terms of these uh, predators, I want to just uh, give you a couple of um, uh, important tips in terms of the use. For predators, um, again, we have many that are available, but you know, there are some predators that are a little better than other ones in terms of uh, finding aphids or staying in an area for helping us with um, aphid management. And one thing that it's good to keep in mind for the use of um, uh, predators when we release them is that uh, releasing the immature stages could be quite helpful because um, unlike adults, they cannot fly out, they cannot move away quickly from the area where you release them. So as you can see here in the picture, we have a uh, lady bear beetle larva. That's the immature stage of, um, of a ladybug, of the lady bear beetle. And these are, uh, will be more helpful potentially than releasing the adults, which oftentimes I have heard many cases where the adults just kind of fly away and they don't stick around for, for very long. So just uh, something to keep in mind. And the same for the lace wings could be potentially uh, something to keep in mind as well. So let us um, look more specifically at some aphid predators, uh, beginning with aphidolitis. This is a, a very important predator that it's uh, commercially available. Uh, here you can see picture the adult, which is a kind of a, um, a tiny midge, very small one. The adult flies out in search of aphid colonies and quickly locates uh, those and will proceed to lay eggs that you see here on the lower uh, left, a uh, bunch of eggs that the, the female has laid. Those hatch and they, then you have the resulting larvae, which are really the, the, the stage that does the job for us. Um, the larvae are uh, very efficient aphid predators. Um, you will think, you will wonder how they manage, but they do. And these tiny larvae quickly um, uh, grab the aphid and will uh, proceed to uh, feed from it rather quickly. And sometimes you may have two or three small larvae uh, of this aphidolitis just feeding away on an aphid. So they're, um, in spite of uh, their morphology, they are very good in terms of um, getting to the prey. Aphidolitis, um, it's um, available in this type of uh, format usually, where you could get a little container with vermiculite and adults will be hatching from pupae that are within that container. And you just open the container in the setting and the adults will fly out and begin uh, searching for the prey. 
You can see on the diagram here towards the right, um, um, summary of the life cycle of this predator going from the egg uh, for the going to the feeding larvae, which are these tiny larvae, very small. It, they will make a pupa that will fall uh, to the ground. And then uh, out of the pupae, you have um, the adults. And it's when you purchase these uh, insects, you buy and really the pupae or the adults are already coming out from the um, shipment uh, matrix that they use in the container. All right, so that's Ephidolidis, an important uh, predator. One that's um, very important too, and it's naturally occurring. So we have many lacewings out in the environment, uh, but these ones can also be reared um, for release. These gray lacewings that you see, here is the adult stage. And these guys are really not doing the uh, predation for us. These are the stage that goes out and looks for um, groups of aphids and they will proceed to lay eggs, as you can see here. And these eggs hatch into small larvae. And these are really the key predators. They are voracious predators. Sometimes they have no respect. <laughs> they even prey on other predators. And so really incredible generalist predators. And readily um, you can purchase the larvae and this is a good stage to release because the larvae will stick around and um, you know hopefully they will remain in the area uh, longer than if you just had released uh, the adults. All right so those were a couple of examples of um, important predators um, in terms of aphids I think lacewings are important, uh, Fidolides it's also important in terms of releases um, ladybird beetles can be helpful, but I will say from my perspective, uh, encouraging those that are naturally occurring will be uh, even better um, than releases. But you know that experience may vary from uh, for different systems. Now let us move on to parasitoids. Parasitoids are a very important group. And let me go through an example of how they operate uh, with using Ephidius colemani. Uh, this is one parasitoid that has had very good reports. Many growers report having successful management of aphids with this species. And here um, you see the adult female going right uh, for an aphid. She's just bending her abdomen, quickly injecting an egg into that poor aphid. And now the um, really aphid is a goner and it's going to be kind of a little capsule or a little incubator for the developing uh, larva of the parasitoid. So in this diagram, you see a similar situation. A parasitoid comes in, attacks the aphid, deposits the egg, that egg hatches into a tiny larvae that consumes the aphid. It develops to a pupa, again, just inside the aphid. And what you see is this um, transformation of the aphid into this pupae that you see here, these cocoons. Um, not really cocoons, but what we really call mummies, aphid mummies, where the aphid just becomes a little case protecting the developing uh, parasitoid. And when the parasitoid adult is ready to come out, it will do so, as you can see in this diagram, and then it will proceed to uh, go out and find more hosts that they can uh, use uh, for their reproduction. So here's the um, important message if you see little guys like that, like little golden round uh, aphids. Um, they're not alive, they're not feeding. Leave them alone because out of that, you will get more parasitoids emerging. So it's, um, and this is also a very important thing to be on the lookout for when you're monitoring, if you're seeing lots of these aphid mummies, that's a very good sign, something to, to keep in mind. All right. Um, now for aphids and their parasitoids, again, naturally occurring, there are many species, but you also have some, again, listed here that are commercially available. And as for much of biocontrol, we're gonna make sure we are selecting the right um, biocontrol agent to the pest that we wanna manage. And so, um, for example, Ephidius colemani is a parasitoid that does very well and really suggested for uh, the use against green peach aphid. That's why you see here this little um, green check mark. It's also one that's uh, recommended for melon or cotton aphid. So not so much for the other aphids on the chart, but for those, we do have other parasitoid species. So if you move over in this table, 
Aphidius herbi is one that is good for the foxglove aphid and uh, good for the potato aphid as well. Now you're wondering, goodness, there are all these different combinations that's, that's gonna be tricky. Fortunately, biocontrol uh, suppliers uh, have come up with you know, blends of these parasitoids. So you could actually buy a couple species at a time to help you in the event that if you're not sure what aphid species you have, or if you have more than one aphid species, which is very likely to happen too, uh, you could get these blends where uh, they will sell you a couple of parasitoid species uh, for release. And uh, one thing that I will address uh, at the end today too, is that we wanna also um, try to encourage those parasitoids that are naturally occurring. Uh, there are many species that are so helpful for aphid management. Aphids in the field will not tend to be a problem and that's much thanks to the activity of natural enemies. So if we can encourage that activity that can help us quite a bit. All right, um, now we move on to mites and just, uh, I'll be taking questions uh, soon. So hold on for a minute more. I just wanna address this other important group of um, uh, pests. Mites are one that is often, one that we have a lot of complaints about. These are really technically not insects, they're arthropods, uh, they're arachnids and many, uh, Many of the problems that we see are really coming from the two-spotted spider mites. These are one that is a consistent pest. And not surprisingly, it has one of the widest host range of any spider mite. They, they can feed just on, on anything. And very important pests, especially um, in high tunnel situations where they find some conditions that are quite favorable to them, like hot and very dry conditions. So unfortunately, that's something that the spider mite likes. And for um, keeping on top of the presence, we're gonna be monitoring or uh, be uh, scouting for signs of the damage, which comes in the way of stippling. Uh, stippling is a very um, typical damage that they produce. And if infestations get out of hand, then you get into um, the presence of dry foliage, the leaves begin to drop and extensive webbing uh, becomes present. So these are things to keep out. You don't wanna get to that point of seeing webbing, that's really not, not good. So looking out for stippling as early as possible, um, it's, it's, it's key. Now, let me um, just show you some examples. These are um, the two spotted spider mite, They're very tiny. Uh, recognized easily by those uh, two dark areas that they have on their body. Now the, the adults could occur in two forms. The one that is more yellowish with the dark spots as the typically the active form that we encounter, but females will pass the winter um, and they will appear in this more yellowish form. So this is the, the same species, but it's just the females that um, are ready to overwinter hiding in uh, soil or crevices in a, in a high tunnel area. And um, so this is the, 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 what to look for if you see those. Close up of the spider mites. Um, unfortunately, they are tiny. So, so to get the details like this, you, you need very high magnification, but I just wanted to share that with you. Um, they're um, very small, but again, they do punch a, a lot of damage um, if they get out of hand. This is what can happen where um, you can see a lot of that stippling, those uh, light color areas where they have damaged um, the tissues, where I'm uh, running my courses over. This is um, typical damage they produce. The webbing too that you can see, but um, if you see this, this is really uh, gotten a bit out of hand in terms of the, the spider mite presence. Luckily, we do have a number of um, natural enemies that are available for management of this mite. And probably the number one um, predator that's uh, highly uh, recommended is uh, Phytocelius persimilis. This is a um, specialist on the two-spotted spider mite. They are, um, do a great job and they're really um, one of the ones that people most often use for, um, for these two-spotted spider mites, Phytocelius persimilis. 
Um, one of the things I did want to mention for uh, today's presentation is that with many of these natural enemies, one key aspect is that you're going to see uh, references to the environmental conditions that are good for them. And temperature and relative humidity can be quite important in terms of uh, promoting uh, optimum conditions for their activity. And so listing here, I have um, uh, oftentimes I'll be listing some temperature ranges and relative humidity ranges where we see that the performance is, is the best and biocontrol agent suppliers will typically give you this information as well. So um, whatever is not shown here, I'm sure your supplier can give you those uh, pieces of information as well. So one, um, thing to keep in mind is again, very, very high temperatures may be detrimental uh, for some of these natural enemies. As an example here, um, NEC about 90 degrees Fahrenheit could be an issue with this phytocillis persimilis mite. So one recommendation is to, you know, monitor the temperature, monitor the relative humidity in the high tunnel. I think that would be very helpful so you can understand better, you know, what are the conditions that um, the natural enemies could be, could be facing. Other predators that are available for um, spider mite management include Neocillus californicus, that you see here. Um, that, that's one that it's, it's available, but really the, the, the better one will be Phytocillus persimilis as a specialist. However, you have these other ones uh, like Neocillus californicus or Neocillus fallacis. One advantage that these mites have is that if they don't have uh, the spider mite to eat, they can survive on other things like pollen. So in that case, um, they can sustain a little better, um, you know, using uh, others, other resources. And uh, we also have the um, other species as well that um, you see here listed. And um, I'll be taking questions in a minute. So let me just um, um, hold on a second, just have some technical issue. Um, the other one that in here in this list, we have Neocillus cucumeris. That's one that uh, it's another predatory mite. Uh, it's a generalist that it can feed on other things. So that's an advantageous um, aspect with this mite. It can also feed on pollen if there has nothing else to eat. And notice that I make reference to um, uh, the fact that for some of these mites, um, they, certain biocontrol suppliers are suggesting not to use them in tomato. One aspect uh, behind this uh, piece of information is that these tiny mites um, can suffer detrimentally from the plant hairs uh, that tomato has, the, the trichomes. So there have been studies documenting that some uh, neocillus mites don't do really have a lot of trouble dealing with the, the trichomes in tomatoes. So uh, this is why you may, you may be seeing some suppliers um, making mention not to use them in, in tomato crops. All right, um, let me move on to um, other types of predators available for um, the spider mites. You do have a, a ladybug under the name of Stethorus punctilum that's available for, um, for release and uh, will feed on all different stages of um, the two-spotted spider mite. That's a good one to kind of supplement perhaps um, other biocontrol agents. And you also have uh, Cecidomid, uh, Mitch, the Peltiella, Carisuga. Peltiella, it's um, again, it's a tiny Mitch, but Again, it can be quite helpful. The larva is the one that does the job for us. And you can see here, uh, Feltiella larva feeding away on a mite. And these ones are very good in the sense that they are very helpful to find those hot spots of the spider mite. But one thing to keep in mind is that it's best to use it with another agent like Phytocillus persimilis. So you will use them in combination um, the predatory mite going after um, the spider mites as you release them, but also the Feltiella uh, releasing them in the hot spots. They will do a nice job um, suppressing, you know, higher um, dense uh, populations of the mite. And in these pictures, you see in both the adults and, and the larvae. All right, so let me um, 
stop for questions. Uh, this is Phytocillus persimilis, um, just to show you um, the little guy here, the orange little guy. Um, those are the predatory mites that are quite helpful for the uh, spider mite. They're specialists on their spider mites, so they really do a nice job addressing uh, this particular pest. And by the way, they will eat everything, mm -hmm. even the eggs that you can see here, the, this roundish uh, little white, those are the eggs of the spider mite and they will go after those as well. All right, let me see if uh, there are any questions or let me know, I will move on. <laughs> uh, yes, Anna, we do have a question. Um, how does the use of HAF fans affect persistence of the predators and parasites in the greenhouse or tunnels? Um, for the ventilation purposes, you mean, yeah. I, I will take it. So. Yeah, um, mostly perhaps with the release, I think that may be one thing to keep in mind, um, especially for the tiny midges, uh, when you release them, you may want to be, be mindful of that because um, uh, they, they may require more of a quiet, um, you know, environment, a more, um, uh, because the, the tiny little flies, they're very delicate. But once they get established, uh, you know, they will do the job um, moving out around uh, the canopies, uh, you know, through the plants well. Just perhaps just at the initial release times, um, that may be an issue. I'm not very familiar with what will be the effect with other, other types of predators um, and, um, you know, and other parasitoids. It's just the... Um, mostly the more delicate um, ones like Feltiella or perhaps the um, Ifidolidis one that, you know, they're more, more of a delicate. And in general, also one thing to keep in mind is um, for many of the predatory uh, and uh, parasitic releases is that it's good to do it at a time when it's, it's um, um, you know, towards the um, dusk or evening time uh, because that allows them conditions to be um, cooler, uh, not so sunny. The, you know, when you get them out of the containers or release them, they're very agitated. They're very, uh, you know, stressed out. And so it takes them a while to kind of calm down and um, they groom themselves. And, you know, they're almost like a little cat <laughs> grooming themselves. And they have to just uh, get acclimated before they move on to really do um, the search for, for prey or, or hosts. So those, um, the release timing is very important, um, doing that when it's not so hot, not so sunny, um, dusk or evening or, um, you know, very early to just give them time to get more acclimated very early in the day. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, yep, we have another one that came in. Uh, it says, my high tunnel has screens on the side to exclude most insects. Does this mean that I will need to rely on introduced predators to keep adults under control or to keep aphids under control or will adults reproduce in a tunnel? I believe some predators could reproduce in a tunnel given if the conditions are right. Um, there may be you know, a chance for that. And um, with screening, um, it, it has kind of a mixed, um, sort of a set of situations. Some screening has been shown to be quite helpful in terms of preventing the entry of things like cucumber beetles. Uh, screening has been shown to be a very good tool for, for those pests. Um, so that's a good thing. Screening on the other hand, in some studies, which I'll mention later today, has shown to um, could be a complicated factor in the sense that uh, for one, it could reduce ventilation. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But also um, the screening could prevent the entry of natural enemies from outside. And so depending on the timing in the season, if you need those natural enemies from outdoors, the screening uh, definitely could be, uh, could be an issue. I think though, um, with the screening, it makes the setting more like a greenhouse uh, where you contain more of the predators or parasitoids. So maybe some predators could get established, uh, especially the ones that are generally general enough that they can sustain themselves on other things like pollen, for example. Um, but, you know, there, there's a study uh, that was done looking at screening and screening. Also, um, they found that in their system didn't contain many of the predators they were releasing either. So that, you know, that's a mixed, um, mixed uh, 
set of information regarding that. But I will say um, it is likely some general predators, if you give them pollen or other ways to sustain themselves, um, they will probably could reproduce and, and keep on going. So that, that will be one advantage. All right, let me move on to thrips, um, just because we have a couple other things to, to address as well. Thrips are another key pest that we find, very tiny insects. Unfortunately, for many of the uh, high tunnel pests, they tend to be on the smaller size. Uh, but, you know, we also have large insects attacking, as you will see later. Uh, thrips are um, uh, very small, less than one and a half millimeters. They are, uh, as adults, um, insects that have wings, as you can see in this picture. Um, it wouldn't appear so, but they can fly out and about. And as adults, you can uh, catch them easily on sticky traps to monitor for the presence. So that, that's a good thing. The same with aphids uh, that have wings, uh, you could use the sticky traps to, to, to monitor for them. The, the uh, thrips though, they will uh, have also immature stages that, um, you know, for those you need to be inspecting the plants to, to find their presence. And they also have a pupil stage that uh, it's found in the soil. As the thrip is going through its development, it moves from, you know, the immature stage to a pupil stage that um, you find it in the soil. So we have not to forget that part because they're not just on the plants. Uh, the pupae can be found in other areas, um, you know, at the base of plants in the soil or on the floor, if, if there's no good cleaning conditions, you may have pupae um, hiding in, in spots there. Uh, if it's do a lot of damage, but really one key concern with that is that they can transmit uh, important pathogens like the tomato spotted wheel virus. So that's the main concern with these um, insects, um, being especially critical, the, the Western flower thrips and the onion thrips are important pest problems. And again, also vectors of, um, this type of virus, the tomato spotted wheel virus. Here's some uh, examples of the type of damage they produce. You see here the adults, which are the darker individuals with wings, and also uh, the larvae, the immature forms, this yellowish cream color. And um, in both cases, they are damaging the surface of the plants, producing very distinctive um, sort of scarring and as they're feeding, they're damaging the cells, uh, feeding on the contents, and that leaves these whitish areas. Along with that, you might see little fecal spots, uh, that's the excrement that they produce, so these little black spots uh, will appear, and again, those are signs of, of thrips presence. As I mentioned, you could quickly monitor for them using sticky traps. Uh, for thrips, usually is, um, we have found that blue traps are very good. But the downside with that is that it's really mostly just for thrips. The yellow sticky traps are a little better in the sense that they will catch other insects that you will want to be on the lookout for. So, you know, yellow prowl is more of a general tool that will be um, better to use. Now, here's some examples also of the, the type of feeding damage. This is an onion. And you can see these light um, areas where the feeding has occurred and maybe a little bit of the black specks for the um, fecal spots that they leave behind. For management, um, fortunately we do have a number of uh, predators that are, um, have shown to be quite helpful. Uh, of much importance among the predatory mites is Neocilus cucumeris. This mite is probably really the one uh, to go for. Uh, it has many good reviews, uh, many good examples where it has been successful in terms of um, dealing with this pest. And so it's, it's a good one to, to select. There are other ones as well, like Amblyseus Wirski, Neocilus californicus. And those are predatory mites that are helpful too, but um, Cucumeris is one that has a very good record. And by the way, for example, in our Yukon floriculture greenhouse, uh, the biocontrol program implemented there relies on cucumeris as, as a predatory mite. So it's, they have good, um, you know, good record. Now, those mites will feed on thrips on the surface of the plant. We also have a mite that will uh, go for the thrips pupae that are in the soil. And that's a Stratioleps simitus. This is a soil dweller mite and they can be quite helpful to supplement the activity of the other predatory mites. So Stratioleps is often used in combination with like, for example, Neocilus cucumeris. 
So you get in the thrips from both ends, from the top of the plant, from the soil. So combining predators, uh, it's a very common practice and it, it, it's very helpful in terms of tackling the different stages of a pest. And the picture you see here, Amblyseo Siversky, this one is feeding on thrips. And um, in addition to these mites, um, we have other, others as well. So we have the um, predator uh, Oreos, the minute pirate bugs. I'll be addressing those in a bit later. Let me just uh, mention a couple of things about all of these predatory mites. Um, Cucumeris, again, is the best one. And um, just as I mentioned before, we have had some research that shows that some mites are not dealing well with the, with the trichomes in tomatoes. So that's why you might see some uh, biocontrol suppliers making statements as to not to use them in tomato uh, for that reason. But there are other predators that you could employ. Um, as I mentioned, Oreos could be one that could be helpful in, in that situation. And Oreos has had a good record in tomato um, for, for pest management. Um, and don't forget, Stratulalep simitutes is one that you could use to complement other predators because that's that soil dweller mite that's going to go after the thrips uh, pupae that are found in, in the soil. All right, let me um, move on. So we have, again, many predatory um, insects. And here's, again, some examples of that activity. This is Neocillus cucumeris. And this picture on the left, you see uh, the orangish uh, mite going, looking for uh, the thrips. And right in the center, uh, it's a thrips, uh, immature thrips larvae. So this mite will go going after that. And here on the right, you see the same thing, um, the predatory mite going right after a, a small thrips immature. So, you know, even the smaller skies can, can do a good job. Now with the um, other mites available, um, you know, just make sure that you check for uh, the crop, the environmental conditions, and don't forget about um, the stratulips for the soil dwelling pupae of thrips. Moving on, um, I'm gonna address one that is very important, not only for thrips, but for many other pests. And this is the minute pirate box, uh, Oreos. This is one that oftentimes people refer to as a very important biocontrol agent. They do occur naturally. So out in nature, we have uh, these little guys uh, quietly available. They can also be purchased for release. And they are ones that will feed on spider mites. They can uh, feed on thrips. Um, fortunately, they feed on all kinds of other things, aphids, psyllids, small caterpillars, eggs of different types of insects, and even white flies. So this predator is quite a generalist, uh, feeding on all kinds of things. And it's, again, you could release it, and it's one that we have found that you could encourage its presence, you can promote um, or sustain it by making sure that you provide um, sort of a uh, supplemental nutrition for it in the form of pollen and nectar. So in the picture here, you see this is an adult Oreos uh, stabbing right away a, a thrip. And um, the thrip here is just goner. And we can sustain, I'm sorry, you can sustain this activity, um, sustain the presence of these predators through uh, the use of insectary plants. Uh, and we find that uh, in greenhouses, one system that has worked very well is the use of ornamental pepper, um, purple flash, and in combination with alyssum, uh, either clear crystal white or a snow princess. So these two plants, the alyssum and the ornamental pepper, provide nectar and pollen that can be very good for this um, Oreos, and that will really uh, enhance its presence. It will make it survive better, so it, they stick around for much longer, or you know they reproduce better. And it's a system that has been uh, shown uh, to be quite successful um, in the Yukon Floriculture Greenhouse. Again, that's something that is used to promote the presence of um, Oreos, and um, one that um, I will be describing a little bit more detail um, later on. So we'll go, uh, we'll revisit Oreos in a, in a bit. Uh, so don't worry, we'll come back to that little guy. Let me move on to white flies because of, of, of time. We, uh, time is flying on us as usual. Uh, but anyhow, I hope you, you having um, some good information for, from today. Let us move to um, this other pest. White flies are a common key pest. And 
In this regard, these are uh, small insects, they're not flies by any means. They're really more related to aphids than anything. And the uh, one that's very common is the greenhouse whitefly, which you see in the picture. Um, for whiteflies, it's very important to be monitoring and really to be on the lookout because they can catch you by surprise. Oftentimes, uh, you will find them on the underside of the leaves. So uh, by the time you see the adults flying about, it's maybe a little too late because the underside of the leaves could be covered by the immatures or eggs. And so it's very important to have active monitoring efforts. Uh, looking for uh, white fly adult, adults in, in yellow sticky traps, also looking for signs of the presence like yellowing of leaves or uh, the presence of honeydew and, and associated pseudimols that grow on the honeydew. Remember honeydew, it's an excrement that some insects produce. It's like a, a sugary substance and aphids produce honeydew. Uh, these guys, white flies too, so it will be a sign of the presence. Now with the greenhouse whitefly, um, it's good to be on the lookout for eggs. You can see here a female can lay 400 eggs in, in her lifetime, so uh, that can be quite prolific. Uh, eggs and pupae uh, can be visible. Um, the pupae are shown here. These are um, where the adult is developing and it will emerge. And if after it does so, you'll have empty pupal cases that you can see here. I'm circling one. And we use the pupae, uh, the shape, uh, to distinguish different species. I won't go into that uh, today, but um, the one for the greenhouse whitefly is it's quite distinguished. It's got, I always think of it like a little cake, uh, the way it's kind of shaped, and um, with this fringe of little filaments around, and kind of like a really, um, kind of like a little cylinder or so that really sticks out, out from the surface. But you do need good magnification to, again, to be able to see this. And for the greenhouse um, wildfly, we do have a number of uh, natural enemies that, again, are uh, mass produced and you can release, including predators, uh, predatory mites, lady bear beetles, uh, even lacewings can go after um, um, wildfly stages. Parasitoids too, really the, the, the primary one tool because they have such a good record uh, of efficiency and success. So predators are helpful, but really parasitoids in this case uh, we see are, are very, very important. And the one that's probably number one will be Encarcia formosa. That will be the parasitoid that uh, takes prominence in terms of um, uh, high success record and uh, widely available for, for use. Here you see some examples of how it's uh, available. Insectaries will produce this, uh, there are different formats in which they will produce them, but they will have a pupae that contain the uh, parasitoid. So this is what you will purchase. And out of the pupae, you will get a tiny, tiny little wasp emerging, and then they go out and about their business looking for the host uh, wildfly that they will attack. So for Encarcia, when the whitefly pupae have been attacked, they turn black in color, as you can see in this picture. In the center is one that has been parasitized. On the top right is one that's healthy, a normal uh, whitefly pupae. And the one on the lower left is one, it's an empty pupal case. So that, that's empty already. And so as I was saying, for um, the use of parasitoids, Again, very, very much recommended. Uh, there have been many successes in, in greenhouse systems, but also in some high tunnels, there have been records of success employing Encarcia uh, for white flies. And so Encarcia for Mosa will be uh, very important. There are other parasitoid species too. Um, one that's very important as well is Eretmoseros eremicos, which you see uh, here in the picture in the lower level. And this one is good, it will attack the greenhouse whitefly too. It's best for another species, the sweet potato whitefly. But uh, again, Encarcia is one that um, is the one to go to uh, primarily for, for the greenhouse whitefly. All right, let me um, move uh, on then. Um, I think, let me see if there's any questions at the moment. Uh, we come in, time is flying. If not, we can move on to other things. Yeah.
I don't know if Nancy's frozen. We do have two questions in here. So um, the first one from earlier, is it difficult to find naturally occurring predators for an artificially creative um, environment? Um, I will say that the challenge will be more finding ways to attract them. You could find many, um, you know, even if you have like a natural habitat in, in an area, uh, in a farm, um, just in, in a regular field, you could find many natural enemies. You could collect them definitely and mm -hmm. move them to where you want them to be. Um, so that can be done. Um, just making sure that they have resources uh, for them to want to stay where you put them. That's a, the key aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, or even more easily, one of the goals that we have in mind is to try to attract them to an area by providing floral resources, usually because those floral resources provide pollen and nectar that um, you know parasitoids and predators really key on for. And um, you know, I'll, oftentimes I'm, I'm looking at flowers that we use for research that that are providing nectar for these insects, and it's just amazing. They, they know how to find these things. They're, they're readily there, uh, feeding away on the nectar. And um, so, if we can encourage them to come using floral resources that that's important uh, but you can definitely collect some and bring them in um, just the labor and knowing what you're collecting and and releasing making sure you don't bring any pests that, that that's important mm -hmm. okay very good i think that answers the second part of that question too so okay so let me move on to one last um insect pest i want to touch upon See if you can find it here. Some of you already probably know what I'm talking about, uh, but it is this little critter. And uh, hornworms, tomato hornworms and tobacco hornworms are um, another pest that it's often um, mentioned in terms of uh, problematic, especially for high tunnels. Um, it's surprising, you know, some of these guys are um, in the field a lot, but I've seen some uh, studies where um, these hormones tend to be more of a problem in the, in the high tunnel. Uh, people still are not quite sure why that is the case, but the um, insect picture here is the adult form of the, of the hormone. This in particular is the tobacco hormone, which uh, in spite of its name, it will attack tomatoes too and other plants in the solanaceous family. Um, the adult, it's a moth, it's a rather large, beautiful moth. You can see here it's feeding on nectar and the moth will proceed to lay eggs which are singly laid on leaves. Um, the example here is that little on the, on the right side, I'm pointing with my cursor, it's like a little pearl, little greenish pearl. That's um, the egg that the uh, hornworm moth uh, will lay. And the moths are nocturnal, so at night they're out and about, you know, looking for, for the host plants. And out of those eggs eventually that they have laid, uh, you'll have um, caterpillars that uh, once they're fully mature will look like that. This is the tobacco hornworm. And I bet many already have had experience trying to remove these guys of the plants and they're quite stubborn. Uh, they hold on well to the plants and the uh, hornworm can be quite damaging, especially at this point because they are just feeding away um, and can produce a lot of defoliation in, in no time. Also, um, I was just trying to um, indicate earlier, they are good at camouflaging. They're hard to find sometimes. And in spite of being rather large uh, caterpillar, they, the colors just blend in very well. The tobacco hornworm is easy to recognize, especially the size, the green color, uh, the little horn-like structure at the tip of the abdomen, uh, typical of hornworms in general, and also one thing that you can see here is these white lines, diagonal marks that go along the body. Uh, notice their shape, this is uh, typical of them as well. And this will be different from another related species that I'll show you later. While it's tricky to find the, the caterpillars, uh, sometimes you come across first their frass, which is the excrement. And these are the, the frass pellets that they produce, um, rather large too. And this is kind of a good sign um, not good to find, but you know it's good to be on the lookout if you see this. Uh, it could alert you as the presence of this uh, of this pest. Now, for hornworms, um, you know they have um, uh, a time period when they're they're around. Usually um, in July, midsummer, they may begin to to appear. 
And they, again, will be feeding on a um, variety of crops, um, peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, and other solanaceous weeds. So for this insect, it's very important to make sure that you don't have weeds that could host them, you know, to make sure that that's removed and, um, you know, be on the lookout to catch them as, as early as possible. On this picture here, you have the other species that it's common, uh, the tomato hornworm. And it looks very much like the tobacco hornworm, except for the, the way this um, pattern is set, these lines. They're more like a little V-shape, um, as you can see here, along its body instead of just a single line. So that's uh, one key characteristic to, to, to use, uh, use to kind of sort them apart. For these insects, uh, these caterpillars and other caterpillar pests, one probably one biocontrol agent that's commonly employed is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis under the short name of BT. And I'll be mentioning a little bit more about this too later, but this is probably one um, that is a very good choice because um, this product and any other very selective product that you could use uh, will target the caterpillar, BT is very specific in its actions. So it will only target the caterpillars and will help us protect other beneficial insects that you could find in your system. So the goal here is to manage the caterpillar without killing other things like parasitoids or predators that are helping you with um, the other pests. So BT is a good one in that regard. All right, and then uh, we also get the help of naturally occurring um, parasitoids, uh, Cotesia being one of them. These are parasitoids that attack hornworms. Uh, the example that you see here, you can see Cotesia adult. That's this little tiny wasp that I'm circling with the arrow. And this little guy came out of the whitish cocoons that you see here. Um, I bet many of you have seen caterpillars covered with these little white structures that uh, people describe them as little rice grains. Uh, all of these are cocoons produced by the developing uh, larvae that have come out of the caterpillar. They spawn their cocoons and uh, the adults eventually emerge out of those cocoons. So if you see this type of thing, uh, leave it alone because the caterpillar it's really just a factory of more of these Cotesia uh, parasitoids that they will go on to attack other hornworms. So those are important just to keep around. They are not available for purchase. You cannot purchase these guys, but you could encourage them, um, you know, uh, promote their presence um, through different things that I will, uh, you could use uh, in terms of adding floral resources. So that's actually brings me to the next part of the talk, uh, which is very important, is the aspect of promoting or attracting natural enemies that are already out um, near your tunnel. We have been going over a number of uh, predators or parasitoids that you could use for, for key pests that you could purchase for release. And uh, those are quite helpful, but in my view, with the high tunnel situation, since at some times during the year, you have this very open system where a lot of things are coming in and out, you have a lot of potential to, to try to attract also uh, natural enemies. And we can definitely um, do that. There's some work that has shown us that there's, um, um, you know, uh, good reason to, to do those. Um, one example is Oreos, that minute pirate bug predators that are quite helpful. Um, studies have shown that uh, you could attract them and conserve them by using insectary plants again, because those insectary plants provide nectar and pollen that uh, it's helpful in their sustenance. I already mentioned the example of the ornamental pepper in combination with a lysum, something that has been done in greenhouse already for a while. Um, a University of Vermont study also shown us that there's good evidence to use the system, especially the alism, because they have seen that you could attract a lot of Oreos uh, using the alism. And so definitely good things to keep in mind of adding these floral resources for attracting these naturally occurring predators. Again, Oreos you can purchase, but you can also find a naturally occurring. Um, some flowers have been suggested as, as a plant that you could uh, use nearby to attract Oreos and other beneficials. So some flowers could be a good thing to add in the vicinity. And um, 
not just for audience, but we have many insectary plants that could be used for, for a number of beneficial insects that you probably will want to have um, in, in, in a high tunnel being active. Uh, another example in this area is, again, the use of alism uh, for hoverflies. This is an insect that I have not discussed yet. Hoverflies are um, important general predator. Uh, really, they mostly do aphids, but they can feed on other soft-bodied insects. And alisum, it's a great plant uh, for um, attracting them, for conserving them. And again, the many studies that point to the benefit of, of using that plant. Here you have um, the hoverfly or flower flies, as they also call. Um, these are very important predators that, as adults, you know, they they do their thing. They feed on pollen, nectar. Uh, they will lay eggs near colonies of aphids, which is really the key aspect. And as larvae, they will help us quite a bit feeding on the aphids. Now, I here show you some examples of, uh, you know, just one piece of information we have as to why we often suggest the use of alism for helping us attract and sustain these predators. You have here um, just a sample of a study we did at Yukon uh, looking at the use of some insectary plants and alism was really the one that attracted the most in a short amount of time in terms of um, hoverflies coming to it uh, to feed. Other plants you know, were good too. Cilantro and dill were very good in terms of attracting these flies and, and providing nectar uh, for them as well. But alism is one that not only from this study, but others has shown that um, has great potential for attracting these flies. And here you can see, uh, again, the adult fly laying an egg amongst the aphids, to what want them to be doing. And the resulting uh, product, the larvae, hatched from the, the eggs, and they go on to feed on aphids, as you can see. Really, this is the activity that we want to encourage. And just like other predators, they're, they're quite good at what they do. Um, these larvae are amazing in capturing aphids and just feeding away. And there are many, many species of hoverflies. Um, just to, I'm showing you some examples here, but um, you know, definitely, you can't purchase this, but you can encourage their, their presence. So next time you see this, think twice as to what you're going to do, uh, because this, if you know, I hope you recognize these guys, but this is um, a hoverfly larva. And um, this is an important predator that we might see again, uh, the larva of the, the flower fly or the hoverfly as they're known. These, will be quite helpful and they feed on um, many aphids and they, they're uh, extremely useful. So one message that I did wanted to add for today too is that as we are trying to manage pests with biocontrol, we can learn about the biocontrol agents that we can purchase, but also it's important to learn to recognize the ones that are naturally occurring. And as an example, um, the hoverfly larvae that you see here, it's not a pest, it's, it's a predator that will be moving around searching for prey. And the end result here, maybe if you see this, you may wonder what is that on my plant? This is a hoverfly pupae. And out of that, you will have uh, the adult emerge. So if you see these structures, again, um, those are things that we want to promote. Even within a high tunnel, you will get uh, hoverfly activity. And this has been shown by researchers looking at um, using again a lism as an example to attract and bring these flies uh, into the system. All right, um, I know time is it's flying on, on us quickly. So I'm just gonna wrap up the section on, on, on predators and, and parasitoids, uh, just giving you some guidelines to, to keep in mind. As I mentioned at the beginning, making sure keep your regular monitoring efforts. That's important to catch things early. With biocontrol agents, you need to release them as early as you see uh, you have detection of a pest. And in some situations, if you have a history of the pest problem, you may have to release them preventatively. So that's another aspect uh, of why monitoring is important. So you have that record to know what is the pest that's going to cause you trouble uh, the following time you have the plants around. So um, monitoring is important. Correct ID of the pest. And another important aspect is that we want to make sure that whatever other tactics we employ, 
that they're not going to be harmful to the natural enemies that we're using. So the selection of any pesticide is, is critical. Um, we want to make sure that is something that will not be harmful. If you have to use a pesticide, make sure that it's not going to be uh, detrimental to any natural enemies that um, you're trying to encourage in, in your area. So using selective materials is, is very, uh, is very uh, key. Um, lastly, if you are buying uh, natural enemies, uh, make sure you inspect their quality once you get them and use them as soon as you can. Uh, they are not things to you know, let's sit around for a while because they're living organisms, very uh, delicate. And so they had to be employed as soon as um, you get them from your supplier. And be aware of what environmental conditions those natural enemies require. Those biocontrol agents have, you know, temperatures and humidity levels that are best for them. And the biocontrol agent supplier could tell you what will be the best uh, for them. So that's uh, just important information to have at hand. Now, another aspect in terms of success for biocontrol efforts, I will say that in the high tunnel situation, uh, we have a lot of opportunity to be thinking about how we bring in a natural enemies, uh, but not the pests, so that's important. Um, using floral resources has been shown to have a good results. A study done at the University of Vermont uh, looked at different uh, what they call habitat plantings in high tunnels and they had uh, you know great success attracting a great diversity of natural enemies parasitoids and predators there's a whole variety of them and at the end I'm going to give I'm giving you the link to this where you can find the results of this study uh, really a lot of diversity that they could attract using uh, these habitat plantings. Uh, for this particular study, again, they found that alisum was the key plant. That was the better one to use because it attracted the beneficials, but it did not attract other pest problems as they saw for other types of flowers they were using. So, you know, that's the key for any um, floral resource you use for any insectary plants. We want to make sure that we are attracting the beneficials, but not the pests. Lastly, um, in terms of uh, thinking about how we can promote activity of natural enemies that are present or nearby, and, you know, there are uh, indications that we could do a lot of manipulations. There's, there's a lot that we need to learn, though, there's a lot to study. But a recent study by Ingwell and others have shown that in a high tunnel, if you add um, what they call predator lures and flowers, they could help a lot in terms of the um, sustenance or their uh, recapture of these um, orios, this minute pirate bug that I've been telling you about uh, today. So what you see in this graph here, just uh, one part of the study that I just wanted to share with you just so that you can see um, you know, the importance of thinking about how to promote these natural enemies. And in this graphic that you see, uh, on the uh, axis here on the right, it's just looking at the proportion of the minute pirate box, the Oreos that were recaptured after they released them into a high tunnel. And they were comparing different types of um, high tunnel situations. Uh, the dark bar referred to a conventional high tunnel that is managed like most people are, are doing without anything um, different uh, done. So that was a conventional one. Uh, the one that the light gray bars refer to what they call the HIPV really is this is the situation where they added flowers and they added these predator lures to bring in predators. And the screen a situation, which is the cross hatch bar, is the one where they actually had screenings in the high tunnel. Uh, their hope was that by using screens, they could keep the predators in and retain them longer. But as you can see in this study, the best situation, at least for just the Oreos bugs, were uh, the use of the flowers and uh, the predator attracting lures. So under those conditions, you had um, the Oreos kind of stuck out longer. Um, they, they, they were more likely to catch them again after, they, after six days of release. So I, I think that in the future, we're gonna be seeing more of the um, you know, thinking about how to increase those floral resources or maybe using predator lures that we could use to attract uh, beneficials into uh, these high tunnel situations. 
All right, let me um, move. We have uh, time is going by on us, and I know that maybe uh, uh, some questions. Nancy, I, I do have other information to share, but I want to take questions now. Um, okay. So in, in case folks right. need to go, um, sure. they can they can do so. Um, sure. My next section was going to be talking quickly about some biopesticides, um, so I will want to address that, but let's see if there's some questions now for what we have talked so far. Okay, great. I also want to just take a minute because we do want to be respectful for anyone who is um, watching on Zoom and is taking their lunch hour. So certainly, thank you all for coming and signing on today. This has been extremely valuable. We do have another bunch of programming coming up, getting to the root video series, some more ag mechanics, another couple of really great agroecology things coming up in March and in May. So please watch out for your listserv. There's, I'm not going to go into all the details, but a lot of exciting programming coming up. Um, I do want to thank Anna for just instilling this like so valuable information. It is going to be recorded. So you will get an email with the link and it is going to be available on our website probably within a week or so. Um, let me get to the questions, but thank you again for everyone for being here. Please, please do your evaluations. We do have those awesome little uh, gifts that we're going to draw someone's random name for and we'll get that to you by mail, a loop and a sticker and a harvest knife. So thank you. We really do listen to what you ask us for, for programming. We want to be very um, helpful in getting you the information that you need to be successful on your farms. So back to the questions. And then Anna, if you want to finish up, anyone who can stay on, please do. We'll finish up with Anna's programming and then wrap up after that. So one of the questions that we had was, can these purchased parasitoids be used effectively against white flies that are outside and not in the high tunnels? Um, yeah, that's a very important question. You could purchase for that purpose, but mostly the examples that show us most success and most efficient has been in, in greenhouse systems. A lot has to do with in those closed situations, you're really lacking a lot of the natural enemies that could help with pest suppression. And that's in one of the reasons, uh, you know, we have to do these releases and um, augment the number of the natural enemies. In many outdoor situations, we want to just encourage what's already there or protect it um, because uh, aphids, white flies, uh, they're different pests that really are, will not go over threshold if the natural enemies in the habitat are, are available. Uh, we have many examples where white flies may flare or may get out of control, a lot having to do with the, the the problem that um, some pesticides will kill the parasitoids that were already, you know, keeping the white fly under control. So just making sure that, you know, if you're using certain um, pest control products that are, you know, compatible with um, the presence of uh, naturally occurring uh, parasitoids. I think you you could purchase, but it's it's an expense, and you know, it's it's um, you know it's a it's a situation where more of encouraging what's already out there uh, will be more, more helpful and or protecting it by selecting very carefully any pesticide product. Um, one example will be pyrethrins. Um, some of those can be quite harmful for parasitoids. Um, you know, there, there are some botanicals that in spite of being a natural control product can kill many of the parasitoids as well because they're, they're very susceptible um, to these. So selecting uh, products that are very specific or very selective. And many of the biocontrol agent producers um, actually do have websites, um, have databases that can give you some idea of what type of, of um, uh, pesticides, either conventional or organic, uh, what type of materials are, at least we have information for in terms of their effects on natural enemies, or maybe consult uh, with extension in terms of what they can suggest for, for that purpose. So I, I think it's just important to encourage what's, what's out there. I don't know if there's other questions. And by the way, the PDF of this presentation will be available um, at the uh, Yukon IPM website if you need to 
look at it for all the reference or maybe solid ground. I don't know what you guys will do, but um, the PDF will be available as well. Yeah, we can take care of that and maybe include it in a follow up email like mm -hmm. with the link to it. Um, another question came in and this was referring to part of what you were covering earlier. It was asking if there was a list of this flora. So you were. Um, Oh, the insectary plants and the floral resources. Yes, um, we used to have a list in the Ukraine IPM website. That, you know, it, it was it's disappeared for a technical issue, but it's, it'll be back up there again. And so there's a list of insectary plants. It's important to select plants that we have um, some sort of documentation that they work to attract particular natural enemies. And it's also uh, important to use um, lists that are you know, well designed in, in looking at uh, the fact that you want to select plants that do not attract pest problems. So that's, that's very, very key. Uh, just going to the reference of the University of Vermont study, they were looking at borage, uh, another flower too, for uh, the using high tunnels. But they found out that those flowers were attractive, were attracting pests also. So, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you have to be very careful into, as to what plants you, you use, especially for the high tunnel situation. Got it. Um, do growing degree days help in a high tunnel? Uh, yes, it will be helpful in terms of growing degree days can help you assess the, um, the heat that your plants are experiencing. So if you want to monitor for plant growth or, or predict, you know, certain stages, keeping track of growing degrees can be helpful. Um, growing degree days can, you know, be helpful in terms of also pests uh, predictions. So for some pests, uh, we have growing degree day models that can alert you as to how far in a development uh, certain insect pests uh, can be found. So uh, the only trick though is that the degree days inside a, a tunnel will be you know, quite different from the outdoor situation. So that's something that, um, you know, that may be um, sort of something to keep in mind is uh, adjusting for that, but um, th there are models available as well. For, for different pest problems and also for monitoring the plant growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the final question that we do have, and then certainly if you wanna finish up with your, a little bit of program, but if anyone has questions beyond this, I'm sure that you can just send them over to us or to Anna at her email. And you know we will try to help you best get your questions answered. So last one, how do you feel about neem oil or a diatomaceous earth in regards to affecting predators? Um, well, for the neem, um, that tends to be tends to be specific, but you know, there could be issues with certain predators. They they have tried to do studies to know the, the non-target effects of, of neem, but um, you know, we don't know all the different combinations, so that potentially could be uh, something to keep in mind. Um, Diatomaceous earth, it's also one that has been used for pest management in many situations, but the thing with, with that potentially could be conflicting with the use of parasitoids, because parasitoids are, can be very tiny and uh, any additional dust, it could be quite um, harmful to them. Uh, in fact, in general, it's recommended, um, you know, for field or greenhouses or high tunnels to try to reduce the dust that one makes in, in a system because uh, just, you know, just general dust. Uh, I know I have allergies to dust, so it's bad, but, you know, just general dust from soil or other things is bad for, for many beneficials, especially the small ones, because for them, it's like being hit like with an asteroid. It's it, the, you know, the, the size scale is so different. So dust for these natural enemies can be um, detrimental. So I, I do not know right, you know, to tell you uh, exactly what could be the exact effect. I have not seen studies for that, but I imagine that's something to, to you know, be careful, uh, especially if uh, small parasitoids are, are in the picture. So that would be something to, to, to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. All right, let me just quickly move on to um, just the last bit I wanted to address. It's, it's not much, just a few slides looking at um, some biopesticides because that has come up in the question of biocontrol. I mentioned a number of um, predators and parasitoids, but we also have other tools 
that are considered within the realm of uh, biocontrol. Uh, we refer to them as biopesticides uh, because these are products that are uh, either a bacterium or a fungus that attacks the insect and they can be formulated in a, you know, in a form that you could spray it or, or put it on the surface of plants and also some other products uh, related to uh, microorganisms. So here we have examples within this group. Um, broadly speaking, we refer to them as microbial insecticides and in, they include bacteria and also entomopathogenic fungi. In the group of bacteria, there are many examples. The, the, the one that really is the most uh, trusted and the most commonly employed is Bacillus thuringiensis. This is the one I mentioned that you could use for the hornworms. This is a very important tool in terms of uh, many um, uh, caterpillar pests. It definitely Bacillus thuringiensis is, is very effective tool against them. Uh, you have other bacterial products too. Uh, nowadays available, um, Chromobacterium uh, or Holderia are examples of, of more, more newer products in, in this area. Entomopathogenic fungi include Bauberia bassiana and also Cordyceps uh, fumosorosia, which um, is kind of the more updated uh, name for Isaria. So that's um, another entomopathogenic fungus that uh, you could employ. Now, I'm just gonna quickly just, um, just give you some highlights in terms of these particular um, organisms. Bacillus thuringiensis, it's again, the one that very, very trusted um, organism uh, used for uh, pest management um, you know, for a while. This is a product that has to be ingested by the pest. And after it gets applied on the surface of the plants, the uh, caterpillar pests will come and consume the plant and will take in the bt particles along with it and after it's ingested it is then when it does it, it, it it's um, net effect uh, essentially what the bt ends up doing is kind of makes pokes these holes or creates these holes in the gut of the insect and this is what you see here in the lower uh, part of this graph where the um, the digestive system or the gut of the insect is compromised and then bacteria from the gut can move into the rest of the body and then that's what uh, kills the, the insect in question. Um, we like Bt a lot because it's very specific. Um, Bt comes in different sort of varieties and uh, the one that's for caterpillars, um, it's going to just attack caterpillars. It will not harm other um, beneficials. So that's one, one of the things why BT is so preferred. And um, it is one that, again, uh, monitoring efforts are important because you want to employ it uh, so that you catch the pests as early as they are, as young as they can be to, for better uh, efficacy. Although uh, BT could also um, get rid of some of the larger caterpillars, but the earlier uh, you apply it in, in terms of catching the young ones is, is the best. Uh, here's one example of what happens to a caterpillar that has been, uh, that has consumed plant material uh, with the BT sprayed on it. Uh, after 48 hours, this soybean looper, uh, it's quite dead. And you can see here the top one, it's the one that was killed by the bacterial infection. And the lower one is, is a healthy individual. For caterpillars, um, you have two types of BT that are available. Uh, the subspecies Kurstaki, which some of you might know well, um, usually referred to as BTK. And uh, you also have the subspecies Aisawi. That's another one that's very important um, to keep in mind because we often recommend people kind of rotate the, the types of um, BT they use. So this you have these two available for uh, caterpillar problems. So that's a, a very important tool in terms of uh, biopesticides. And nowadays, um, you know, there have been new developments and new discoveries, and we have other bacterial mm -hmm. uh, insecticides available. Uh, Chromobacterium subsugi is one um, that um, it works a little different than BT, particularly um, that employs Chromobacterium has this uh, repellency action. So for some pests, it might be acting as a repellent. 
for some, it's kind of like a stomach poison killing directly the pest, or it might um, affect the reproduction of the pest. So um, the, the product uh, that has this is uh, Grand Evo, that's uh, the one that really contains this organism. Um, I'm not suggesting or endorsing any product, but I'm just giving you examples of how you're going to find them um, if you're looking for for something that contains them, these um, particular choices. So um, another one is um, Burkholderia. This is a bacteria that um, is used, it's a heat kill uh, bacteria and also uh, combines the, the spent fermentation media uh, of the process. And this particular product uh, works by contact and also by ingestion. So. Um, the insect pest will consume it, but it also will have activity just by contact, by uh, landing on the insect. And for this particular one, um, it works a little different than the previous two examples. This one um, kind of messes the, um, interferes with the molting of the insect. So for this particular um, bacterial product, this is what one might see. Uh, as an example, this is a caterpillar uh, that has been, um, you know, exposed to this porthole area. And instead of uh, molting or eventually turning into an adult insect, which is what normally will happen, um, they really cannot go through that process. And they remain as a, as a larva that's kind of messed up or, uh, or dies in the, in, as a larva. And in that manner, you prevent the development of more adult insects. So for this particular product, that's uh, how it may operate. So you, um, you try to diminish the pest population from just not letting them uh, make more adults in a sense. So it kind of messes their, their molting process. So that's for that. And lastly, um, in addition to these bacterial products, uh, we also have a couple of uh, fungi that have been um, um, you know, that are available, uh, one being Bauberia bassiana. This is probably one that has a, a long record of use and uh, in greenhouses, it is, it is one that it's, uh, you see available for those systems. Um, we have uh, Bauberia bassiana being a fungus that can attack uh, white flies, aphids, thrips, uh, plant bugs, a number of other insects. Uh, pests and what you see here in the picture on the lower right is just an example of what happens to a white fly pupae after um, it has the uh, an in, been infected by Bauberia going from this kind of normal white color to this more reddish brown and uh, out of that you will not have any adult white fly coming out. So um, you know this is a fungus that it's available and uh, some formulations are unrelisted so that's uh, one if you're interested in that make sure you look for, for that designation and um, Bauberia bassiana again will be um, another tool that you could employ for biocontrol efforts. Lastly um, another fungus I did want to mention is Cordyceps uh, fumosorosia. Um, also known as Cesarea fumosorosia, that was the older name. Um, this is another fungus that is naturally occurring, but now it's formulated into this uh, biopesticide product. And the target pest for this will be things like white flies, thrips, aphids, um, spider mites. There are a number of products that contain um, this fungus. And on the lower right here, you can see what happens to the insects after they've been exposed to it. On top uh, of the picture here is an aphid that um, after a short while, this aphid has been exposed to the, um, the, the fungus. And then um, if short time after, the fungus kind of invades the body of the insect, it penetrates the cuticle of the insect. And then it will, uh, after a while, it sporulate, making more spores so that um, it could kind of disperse itself to other potential hosts. So this uh, kind of white fluffy material is the end result of the fungal infection. And the same thing is happening to that weevil on the bottom, another insect that has been infected by this fungus. You can see that whitish material coming out from it. That's just the uh, uh, sporulating fungus, you know, dispersing more of its spores so they can land on, on other insects. All right, and I think uh, with that, I just wanted to leave you with the uh, resources that, um, 
you know, hopefully uh, can be helpful to you. Uh, we have a number of uh, websites that are relevant to the discussion today. Um, one that is quite helpful is um, hosted by the uh, Association of Natural Biocontrol Producers. And this is the um, publication of guidelines for natural enemies um, 2021. And uh, you can get this freely as a PDF from the website listed. Um, they will give you a list of all the different insect areas and what natural enemies they produce, and also the different target pests for each natural enemy. So it's a very nice, comprehensive list, a great resource if you are shopping around for uh, beneficials. Uh, the Yukon IPM website also has uh, good information in terms of pest ID and also the use of natural enemies. Uh, the greenhouse section has a lot of information about monitoring many of the pests I, I mentioned and also uh, biocontrol uh, information as well. And the vegetable IPM section also has an area for high tunnels. So also those could be resources uh, for you. Um, the University of Vermont uh, High Tunnel Pest Management website is another nice resource where you will find um, a document that has the results of the study uh, where they were looking at the um, adding uh, floral resources to high tunnels to see what will work out. And again, as I told you, Alison was really one that they found out to be very good. And lastly, um, the sustainable pest management in greenhouse and high tunnels. Uh, this is a fact sheet uh, that has even more information also. Um, uh, they have a nice um, summary of uh, a study they did where they compiled the experience of many growers uh, in New York as to what they, they had uh, as a result of using biocontrols. So that's a nice fact sheet that uh, can be quite a nice resource and uh, again, freely available at this website. And so with that, I, I thank you for your time. Um, if Nancy lets us, we can go through yeah. more questions. But other than that, um, uh, please uh, let us know if, if by email if you have other questions that we can assist with. Thank you. Anna, thank you so much for doing the presentation today. It was really amazing. I mean, it's so science, it's so overwhelming, all of the information you presented. So personally, I'm so glad that we have a recording of it so that we can study it and revisit it to get all the details out. Um, and the PDF will be available too. Yeah. Correct. Right. We'll, we'll send a follow-up email with a lot of these resources on it and some more information, including the evaluation. But please, if you were able to snag the link in the chat, please do so and um, follow up with doing our evaluation. It is really valuable to us. Um, if you want to take any additional questions, I'm fine with that. We, you know, I, I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. I think the one question that we weren't able, that I did see, was um, the best place to purchase the parasignoids. Yes, and for that, I will suggest you um, look at this uh, guide to purchasing and using commercial natural enemies. That mm -hmm. has um, a really comprehensive listing of all the insect areas around the country. Um, yeah. I will say really it's gonna come down to price. Uh, one thing that that's really, uh, it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't kill the issue, but it's, it makes it a big obstacle is the shipping cost. The shipping cost for many of the natural enemies can be quite high. So, um, you know, studying where you're getting them from so that shipping is not such an issue. Um, mm -hmm. And also just uh, one of the things is planning ahead so that, um, you know, that you can maybe your shipment can include more than just one type of natural enemy uh, to make it more worth it. So that's another idea. Um, but this list has a nice, uh, very comprehensive listing of, there are many insect areas around the country um, producing or reselling natural enemies. So I will suggest going there um, for that. And, and each, many of them kind of, um, you know, do the same natural enemies, but some specialize uh, on some, some groups. So it's really just looking at that list and finding what is the best um, for that situation, for your situation. Okay. Um, it looks like maybe Cynthia has her hand raised. Cynthia, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Thank you. Um, I was having difficulty using the uh, survey. I, I uh, copied and pasted it into my search bar and tried it that way. And it wasn't letting me, it was letting me answer the multiple 
choice questions, but it wasn't letting me enter any text in the bars. So um, I don't know if I'm the only one having that problem, but I just wanted to let you know. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate that. We will um, send out an additional uh, link. So maybe after the call, we can revisit that and make any corrections. So you should be getting the follow-up email with that within a day or so. And if you want to go through and, um, you know, plunk in any of your answers there, we would totally appreciate it. All right, with that, I guess we'll conclude our program from today. And thank you again for joining us. I really feel like this was super valuable and appreciate Anna's time and expertise on this subject. So look forward to more agroecology programs coming up soon.